Hey everybody, this is Uncle Doug coming to you again from one of the ministry houses in Liberty, Missouri. Um, I want to address uh, something that uh, people bring up every once in a while. And I've been kind of having a discussion on Facebook with somebody about fruit. And how they feel like fruit has to do with how many miracles are obvious or how much supernatural stuff seems to happen. There's a place here in Kansas City called World Revival Church, which I'm sure is not going to result in the world having revival. And they have a, he preaches a sermon, and then at the end, they have this tradition of everybody like bum rushing the stage so he can touch them and they can all fall down. And they flop around on the floor, and that's revival. Except it's not. Um, I used to follow a blog called Kingdom Power on the Street dot com, which I don't know if is even there anymore. Um, but it was a, a bunch of kids, a young 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 folks in Atlanta that were going out on the street and praying for healing and people getting filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues at high school football games and just random inner city people getting healed of stuff. And every week or so, I'd get on there and see what was going on with them and the cool stuff that was happening or whatever. Over the course of a year or two, uh, I think it's fair to say, and I'm not being insulting, I, I, I think I'm summarizing f fairly well. Um, after a year or two, they began to get frustrated because they would go into a neighborhood, God would heal people. And then they'd say, okay, great. Um, you want to accept Jesus? Yeah, sure, whatever. Okay, great. Do you want some discipleship? Can we start a home group in your house? Can we do a Bible study on Tuesday nights and invite the neighborhood? No. Um, pretty, what they found was, I think I could fairly summarize, that in this entitlement age, that we have, and maybe particularly in the area where they were, people would get healed and are like, hey, thanks. Not going to change my life at all. Don't owe anybody anything. I deserve to be healed. Um, and what they, they, they got kind of frustrated because it wasn't resulting in salvations, unless you count the sinner's prayer, said by somebody who doesn't really mean it. And it wasn't resulting in anything like discipleship or replication or opening new cell churches or home churches or anything. Uh, a bunch of people who felt they were owed a healing got a healing. And they didn't much care whether it was Muhammad or Hare Krishna or Jesus or whoever. They were glad to be healed and that was the end of it. Um... The healings seem to be real impressive to the immature. And uh, the Bible talks about it's an evil generation that seeks a sign. And cessationists often pick on continuationists that believe in the gifts of the Spirit because they're an evil generation that requires a sign. Um... Uh, but I don't I don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit because I require a sign. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit because they're real and God's proven it to me. I was following God since I was six years old, well before I even knew of the gifts uh, particularly and certainly never felt like I needed them to prove that he was real and that he deserved my obedience. And when I didn't obey, it was out of raw naked rebellion because I knew better and knew he was real. Anyway, so no excuse there. 
Um, I think God is far more interested in a transformed life when a sinner confesses their sins and turns to God than he is of somebody's uh, leg growing out half an inch or uh, losing weight in a prayer line or gold teeth or anything else. Uh, it makes me wonder sometimes uh, why people are so uh, desirous of physical signs when the spiritual signs are the eternal ones. This jar of clay doesn't really much matter. Um, and I have people all the time say, well, it's, it's, it has to be God because Satan doesn't heal people. Uh, well, Satan can certainly leave somebody alone for a while if it gets them following the wrong guy and, uh, gets them convinced to give their money to a charlatan. He can certainly stop the symptoms of whatever he's causing on you or move from being an ulcer to be an irritable bowel or something else. And uh, I've seen demons hop off of people in one place and hop on in another place. Uh, when they weren't fully delivered, uh, they just kind of rebuked them around because they didn't close the doors. The person didn't confess. It didn't, it didn't slam the door shut. They didn't know how to keep their cup full. So they'll rotate and kill you some other way. Uh, I'm not exactly saying, saying that Satan heals people, but he can certainly leave them alone. And, uh, there's lots of examples of people that have sold their soul to the devil. And, uh, he made them famous, gave them money. Yeah, maybe they did, uh, you know, overdose and commit suicide and go crazy and whatever, but, uh, you know, didn't die of cancer. Anyway, um... Revival is and is going to be about confession of sins, brokenness, people that are changed, people that are crucifying their flesh daily because they love God, not out of fear of hell, but because the presence of God is there and they can't help but do it. They know the right thing to do and they do it because it's the right thing to do. Not because pastor told them, not because of fear of hell, but because they love God and they feel the presence of the Lord in a way that commands their confession of sins and repentance and turning away. If a person goes every Wednesday night to a particular congregation, pastor lays hands on them, they fall down on the floor, and they get up the next Wednesday, do it all over again, they are unchanged. And that's a real bad sign. They ought not to be constantly getting knocked down. <coughs> I've seen it, and I've seen the real. I've prayed for people a couple times, and they just lock up, and their pinball machine tilts. And it happens because somebody with a great big cup pours on somebody with a cup like a shot glass real hard, real fast, dumps everything on them, and it just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tilts their pinball machine and out they go while the Lord kind of reprograms stuff in their head. That's the real. When they get up off the ground, they should have more fear of the Lord. They should have uh, been to heaven, been to hell, seen something, gone through something, have some fruit, meaning they're closer to God than they were. They're more repentant. They're more broken. They're going to have more peace, patience, gentleness, long-suffering, kindness, brotherly love, whatever, than they had before. If it's just people chasing an emotion or chasing a feeling or chasing a high, it ain't God. It's just not. Um, so I'm focused on if somebody falls down, which I'd rather they didn't, if, I, if I'm holding somebody's hand weak in the knees, I let up for a minute and uh, stabilize them because there's no point to me in them laying on the floor. Um, but once in a while, somebody will lock up. And uh, 
I want to see when they get up how they're different. Uh, one, I went to a little church down in the city one time, mostly African American. I knew the pastor. He invited me to come up to pray. Uh, I said a few things and prayed. The lady that invited me in was really nice and uh, showed me to my seat and was real sweet. Took time with me, chatted with me, and whatever. And so at the end of the service, they're going to have everybody come up and pray for him. And he preached a, a humdinger about confession of sins and repentance and whatever. And he invites me to come up and lay hands and pray with whoever wants to come. And uh, so I'm praying with people. And then this this lady that was the greeter at the door that was real nice to me stands in front of me. And I hold her hand and the Lord says, just push fear the Lord at her as hard as you can. So I'm like, okay, Lord, whatever you gave me, whatever whatever you put in me, whatever awe, whatever respect, whatever fear, whatever terror, whatever it is that I have that you gave me, Lord, give it to her. And I just, like a fire hose coming down my arm, could feel it just pushing at her. She doubles over and starts screaming. And is holding my hand there for a minute, maybe, a minute and a half, just with her weight kind of suspended on my arm as she's bent over, screaming, uh, wailing. <laughs> and then she lets go doesn't look up at me, doesn't even stand, stand up, and just hobbles over to the side of the altar where it's all, it's in the, it's like fellowship hall kind of uh, thing downstairs of a, a building, and it's all tile. And she lays flat out on the ground, uh, face straight on the tile, wailing for 15, 20 minutes, just wailing. She, I, I can't, I can't lay flat face down on the tile like that. But anyway, uh, puddle starts growing about the size of her face. And you know, it's the Lord when you don't even care how long the snot drips. You just don't even care. You don't wipe. You don't care who sees it. It's, you know, the Holy Spirit's moving and I don't care. Anyway, she kind of slows down. I finished praying with somebody. The Lord goes, says, go over there. And push some more at her. So I walk over there, put my hand in the, on, on her shoulder, and just push some more at her. She starts wailing again. And uh, I leave her alone. I, I'm, I'm praying with other people. I look out the corner of my eye 20, 25 minutes later. There's a puddle bigger than her head on the tile. And I watch her get up, sniffling, go to the uh, little kitchen in the back, get some paper towels, clean up the floor, and then hobble out the front door, get in her car, and drive off. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I didn't ever get back there. I didn't talk to her afterwards. I don't know exactly what happened, but she had some encounter with something that that did something for her soul. And uh, you know, uh, the the right the right attitude coming into the presence of God is, is, is on your face wailing and crying and trying to hide under something. Anyway, uh, you know, we've seen people heal the stuff, but no, but people, people are like, well, that's not cool enough. That's not fancy enough. Not everybody's healed. Yeah. Not everybody's healed. I can't find any statement from Smith Wigglesworth or John G. Lake or anybody that said everybody that they prayed for got healed. In fact, John G. Lake was pretty clear that a lot of people wouldn't get healed because they had unforgiveness in their heart, they had resentment, they had other stuff that they wouldn't lay down. And so when that was figured out, they just tell them to go away. There's no, there's no hope for you for us to pray until you lay that down, and they wouldn't. Anyway... I think it's far more miraculous in that case for that heart to turn to God and be broken than it is for them to get their physical healing. I think a lot of those guys like John G. Lake and, and Smith Wigglesworth and A.A. Allen didn't consider a physical healing as particularly unusual or particularly, you know, attention getting uh, in heaven <laughs> 
It doesn't say when somebody's healed of cancer that the angels rejoice. It says when a sinner turns from his ways. And it is far more miraculous to take our nasty dark hearts and turn them toward God than it is to pray for a knee or a, a, an elbow or a, a, a migraine or, or cancer and see it healed. If you're a grandma that's got some grandkid or some kid on crack, it's been to prison, and you've been praying for them to turn, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> a whole lot more prayer is required <laughs> to get some people into the kingdom than to, than to get them out of the hospital. <sighs> anyway. Uh, I know this is revival. I know that God, what God is doing here through the YouTube channel and here in person in Liberty is revival. It doesn't have to be uh, thousands of people and TV cameras coming from all over and every hotel booked to be a revival. Uh, typically it's not. It's it's like one of those guys that, that gets a hit movie and they say, wow, you just came out of nowhere. No, I've been waiting tables in Hollywood, taking small parts for 20 years. I've been working my way up to this. I didn't come out of nowhere. I, I wasn't just found. I've, I've been working and toiling and sweating and whatever. It's just that now you noticed. And I know that God is having a revival in Liberty and that there are people all over town, not just people involved with us, that are getting closer to God. I hear from drug dealers that they're sitting around the house talking about Jesus. Uh, I, I, I uh, am far more impressed. But it's harder to see. It's harder to discern. And the foolish, immature want something fancy, something something. You know, show me an x-ray, show me a doctor's report, show me a whatever. I'm like, I'll show you a transformed life. A person that is unrecognizable as who they were before. That has laid down everything in this world and won't conform to anything that society thinks and feels and wants. That's miraculous. To buck this entire system, friends, family, everybody, and serve the Lord with your whole heart, that's a miracle especially in America. I wish, uh, uh, maybe I'll just string a bunch of quotes about revival onto a video. Uh, there's a, a good source of all that kind of stuff on sermonindex.com where uh, just lots of quotes of different folks. If, uh, Anyway, uh, a lot of good stuff there, a lot of good sermons, a lot of famous um, preachers of various kinds and denominations. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> I wish there was better teaching about revival, about what it is, about what it takes, about what it looks like. So many people are confused, confused flimflammed by the white suit wearing Rolex wearing guys or the smiley face best life now guys or the witchcraft charlatan uh, showboaty guys and thinking that's revival and broken contrite hearts that are turned to God that are dissatisfied with this world is revival. And I'm praying for your revival. And along the way, if God heals you, great. But revival is more important. Taking a lost, dead, cold, rotten, stinking sinner and turning them to the Lord is the whole point of this. That's the gospel. The other stuff is the cherry on top. That is the gravy. That is the extra that will follow 
the preaching of the gospel. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. God bless you all. Know that we're praying for you. We appreciate your prayers. In the name of Jesus, amen.